Excited to welcome Xavier head coach Travis Steele to the podcast. Coach Steele has spent the majority of his coaching career at Xavier, where he has been the director of basketball operations, assistant coach, and associate head coach prior to becoming head coach. Having worked under Sean Miller and Chris Mack, Steele has been part of a Musketeers program that has been to eight NCAA tournaments, including an Elite Eight run in 2017, as well as being a part of two Atlantic 10 regular season titles and one Big East regular season title. Coach Steele, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Uh, tremendous. going to be exciting to talk to you. Thanks for doing this in season as well. And uh, it goes into our topic, which is we're going to talk a little bit about what does a coach do from one game to the next. And uh, we'll just give a little bit of a background. You played Wednesday. You play again Saturday. You won Wednesday. We'll talk about whether you won or lost in terms of how that changes things. And it probably doesn't. But uh, take us just through the moments after a win, say, on Wednesday night. What are you and your coaching staff doing? Yeah, we immediately watch our, our game uh, versus Moorhead State. That's who we played on Wednesday night. And uh, usually I'll watch the full game. Then I watch all defensive clips back to back to back. And then I watch all offensive clips back to back to back. Try to see if there's any themes at all that we can show our team that next morning. Right. So we can kind of close a little bit at the book on Moorhead State so we can move forward. Um, I always look for game goals. I have goals on the offensive and defensive end that I've kind of come up with to kind of keep us in the top 25 uh, nationally in both the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. I have my own sheet. I type it up, uh, you know, as I'm watching it and uh, to kind of see if there's any areas where we're trending in the wrong direction, right, or if we're hopefully continuing to trend in the correct direction. Um, from there, you know, like, for example, Moorhead State, we didn't get done with the game till 1030. I watched our game probably till about 1.30 a.m. And then you start kind of, we have Marquette. It's a quick turnaround. So one of our assistants, you know, we split up scouts. Um, every three scouts, um, our assistants kind of change. I got three wonderful assistant coaches, Jonas Hayes, Danny Peters, and Dante Jackson. So Danny Peters has the Marquette scout. So he's been watching Marquette for the last week, two weeks. Right. And he gave me a file folder at a, at a folder on my desk uh, right after the game that had everything in their personnel, his thoughts on practice, his thoughts on how, you know, we're going to defend, the, you know, certain you know, specific actions. You know, what do we need to, to do in order to win the game? Uh, I look at that after I watch the, uh, the our, our, our previous game and then I start to dive into the stats. I like to look at all the analytical data. And then I watch full games. You know, I, I was able to watch, I think, two full games that night. And then obviously the next morning before practice, you know, I watched a couple more, more games just to get a really good feel um, on Marquette. So you're going to bed late that night. Very late. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a night out, Chris. So I, I can stay up until about 5 a.m. Um, but you know what? My kids, I got I got a, a two-year-old that's my alarm clock. That wakes <laughs> me up every morning at 7. So... <laughs> So you're not getting much sleep that night. Uh, just talk to us maybe quickly about how you interact with the players, say post game on Wednesday. How are you interacting with the players in terms of wrapping up that game uh, from that night and maybe the next morning into getting ready for Marquette? Yeah, you know, I, I usually don't give too much of an emotional speech, Chris, after the game because um, I want to watch it first. I always want to give them the correct information. So, you know, we'll wrap it up, let them know what the schedule is for the next day as far as when breakfast is, when lifting is, practice, film, different things like that. Um, that's when I give my feedback after I've watched it, right? And, and, and that's when we can get the really specific, specific things. So, um, you know, so that, that next morning, usually we'll watch film with our guys. And like I said, we'll theme it up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm big into themes. I don't want to just show random clips because I don't think that does really anything. I don't think your players get anything out of it. And I want it to be short. Right. Our, our attention span of our guys. I'm not trying to watch a full half or a full game. Um, you know, is it is it? Hey, listen, we didn't play off at two feet well enough in the half court. Here's three clips of that. You know, here's transition defense. We made a huge point going into the game of stopping the ball higher out on the floor. Here's four clips of that. And and then kind of you continue to move on. Um, you know, that that's kind of how we close the book with those guys. You know, we do always talk about. Chris, and the one thing that I would do always talk about after the game is how many wars did we win? So, you know, we, we break down the game into 
10 four minute wars for us. There's a media timeout under 16, under 12, under eight, under four. Um, we let those guys know where we are during the game. Right. And we always say the team that wins the most four minute wars usually wins the game. And then I always let those guys know how many kills that we had. So kills would be getting three stops in a row. It's something we talk about every time out as well. Our goal is to get seven kills in a game. And when we've done that, we've won 97.5% of our games here as a, when we've had seven kills. So let those guys know where we are as far as that goes. And then we do the junkyard dog presentation, which is basically who, uh, who won all the hustle stats, the stats that take no talent. That's kind of how we uh, close up that night. And then we move on to the next day. So that would have happened post game or does that happen the next day? Okay. That happens post game. Yeah. So I okay. have a guy keep those stats live. Right. Um, you know, just so we can do it post game and have a little bit of fun with it. That's great. That's a lot of fun. Uh, and then you referenced themes a few times. So an example of a theme that you just referenced was say playing off two feet. That would be an example of a theme or defensive transition or some areas like that. Yeah, correct. And it, there's a lot of different themes, of as course. you know, um, but it's all about our system. That's what I always say. Listen, hey, before we start moving on to the next opponent and, and figuring out these guys, it, it, it's more scouting. It comes down. It's more about us. Right. You know, every team's going to be a little bit different, um, but it's 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 our philosophy here at Xavier. We're do what we do program and we want to get better in our own habits. You know, so. You know, when you're looking at the next opponents, like, okay, well, here's what they do. Our guys already know how to guard it. They've had those habits all fall, uh, you know, leading up preseason. Um, you know, so it's just more about, you know, doing us. So you're not changing much of your defensive philosophy or anything specific relative to the opponent. You're doing what you do. Correct. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, listen, there's, I've been on staffs where it's been the other way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, every game's different and, you have to memorize that whole every set play of that other team. Um, you know, for us, we don't have to really do that. You know, our guys have all the solutions, all right? They already know what to do. Now it's just steaming it up for those guys. So even when we go into the next game, you know, figuring out, hey, th th these are the themes that we're really going to focus on and practice the next two days. Let's get them a ton of reps of it. And that way they know what, to, know, know what we have to do going into that game. Having done that as a coach, too, I realized that I didn't personally, and I'm curious your opinion, I didn't personally care what the other team called their play because we identified it according to what we called it. And if they run cross screen, down screen, we just call it what we call it, not having to worry because it's about perceiving and identifying more. It is about the word. That's exactly right. You know, again, I, our, our guys take a lot of pride in it, too. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they take a lot of pride in our system. I think that's the one advantage of doing it this way, Chris, is is. You, your guys, number one, they get the habits that they need, right? You get better in your system throughout the year. You're not changing game to game. Um, but there's also that sense of pride. And when your seniors can teach your younger guys, this is how we do things here at Xavier, right? It's a heck of a lot more powerful coming from a senior and a junior who really know our system than coming from me. And that's when you kind of create that leadership that you really need within your program to be successful as well. Well, and that buy-in comes from the success of it working too, where a senior or junior can tell them that, hey, this actually works. And here's an example of when it worked in the past. Exactly. Curious then with you, uh, you, you don't look at Marquette film before you're done with the Moorhead game. Is that how you personally do it? And then you assign it to an assistant. You talked about referencing. So assistants have a certain number of games per season with scout. And then you set that prior to the season. I do. So I, I go down and I'll look at the schedule and I try to, I try to stay away from back-to-back -back games mm -hmm. as much as possible. Now, listen, during league play, um, all bets are off a little bit, you know, so I try to, you know, the assist, so say Jonas Hayes has uh, Marquette, you know, like, well, he had him last year. I'd like to keep him with Marquette if possible, because he knows them really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there may be instances where they do have a back-to-back -back every once in a while, you know, within the schedule, but I try to stay away from that as best as possible. I give them those assignments in the fall, right? So once we get their, our Big East schedule, I, I give them their scouting assignments so they know kind of moving forward who they have and who they can start focusing on. So if it's not their scout, what is the expectation of an assistant in terms of their preparation, say for Marquette, when it's not their scout? Yeah, so like, uh, so I have guys have certain uh, responsibilities. You know, for example, Danny Peters on our staff, he's responsible for our underneath out of bounds defense. Doesn't matter who we're playing. You know, we've been playing Marquette, Villanova, Creighton. 
That's his responsibility. Dante Jackson is responsible for our underneath out of bounds offense. I want everybody on our staff to have a stake in it. Right. And I think that's important, but we also have to work ahead though. Some of the staff does, you know, in order to prepare us for the future games. And I understand that as well. Um, you know, I'll have, you know, I have meetings with staff to talk about substitution patterns. So Danny Peters on our staff, he knows every game he does substi substitutions for us. You know, I'll go over, hey, here's the matchups I want to stay away from. Here are the matchups that I like. Um, you know, here's kind of what we're looking at, a rough shell of it in the first half. Right now, obviously, things can change, Chris, because due to foul trouble, injuries, things happen. But it gives us a rough shell to kind of work off. But I want everybody to obviously have stake in the game, so to speak, uh, with, with each game. Take us through recovery for players post game. Uh, what are some of the things that you're doing to help your players recover and then obviously be able to get back to Thursday, whether it's practice, whatever, take us through that process from recovery to the next practice. Yeah. Training room is mandatory. It's not optional. Um, I think that's first and foremost, it, you find that a lot of guys want to get out right after the game, maybe go see their family members or go grab a bite to eat with their girlfriend or friends or whoever. Right. And you got to make it mandatory. And, uh, you know, we have we have a guy on staff that makes sure he lets me know that everybody goes and sees the, the, our trainer, you know, after the post game. Um, you know, they do all they'll get the cold pool, hot pool. You know, we have all the stuff, the, the boots. I, can't, I forget what they're called. Chris, Nordatech boots, I think is what they're called. Yeah. Um, cryo. We yeah. do a lot of cryo as well. Crowd therapy, um, you know, whatever our guys like, like we have the resources here, Xavier, and we're really, really blessed. Is, is nutrition part of that, too, in terms of mandatory? Yes. So, you know, our, our strength coach will have a meal for those guys right after post game um, that he selected all the food. He's worked with a with a dietitian um, to make sure that it's nice and healthy and those guys get the nutrients in their body so they can replenish and be ready to go tomorrow the next day. I have a quick story about that. When I visited an NBA team and they redesigned their practice facility, one of the major changes was moving the food to the front of the building. Because players after practice would just leave and not go to the back of the building. They just go right to the front of the building and leave and not get their food. And just by simply doing that, they increase the amount that the players got their food. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Hey, you got to know your audience. Yeah. Right? And you got to know who you're dealing with. I think that's so important. <laughs> well, we think free food players are going to grab it all the time. But, you know, they do, as you said, they want to get out. They want to get on with their day in their life. But <laughs> yep. that's great. Uh, so players in terms of recovery. Um, ideally, hopefully they get sleep and they get up the next day. What takes through the next day in terms of the players, first of all? Yeah, usually like, you know, if we have a late game like we did uh, Wednesday night, an 830 tip, um, you know, I'll let those guys sleep in. You know, sleep is so important, as we all know, all the studies show it. Um, but we may have a late breakfast, you know, almost dang near a brunch. Um, you know, so we'll have breakfast at like 1030 a.m., We'll watch a little bit of film to close up the Moorhead State game right after that at around 11. And we let those guys go. They're probably in the training room a little bit, especially if the guys have lingering injuries and, and uh, just bumps and bruises. Then usually what we do, uh, Chris, we'll practice at 2 o'clock. So well, our guys lift every day. And I think it's a little unique. You know, that our, our strength coach, Chase Campbell, came from the Orlando Magic. Um, and that's how they kind of do it in the NBA. You almost lift it. You lift every day you practice. And it took a little bit of time for our guys to adjust to it, um, but it's been great for our guys. And so they lift as a team leading up to practice, almost like our warm up in, in a way. Um, now, usually a day after a game, it's going to be more of a recovery lift, recovery session, you know, maybe for about 30 minutes. And then, uh, then we'll be out on the floor. You know, I would tell you if with, with two game lead up after a day of a game, no, no, no day off we're probably going to be out there one hour max mm -hmm. and no, and we're not going to be uh, competing. I've learned my lesson on that over the years. Right. So you kind of, you know, our, our strength coach is way smarter than myself, Chris. Um, <laughs> he kind of breaks it down into like different quads. So a quad one day would be a day off low intensity, low volume, a quad two day would be uh, high volume, low intensity. Quad three would be high intensity, low volume. And then quad four would be high volume, high intensity, right? So you almost want to put them on the wave. So day off, you know, if day off would be day one, be all the way down low. Quad two would be a little bit higher. Quad three would be a little bit higher than quad four is a game day. If we want our guys to be able to play hard and have juice on game day, we have to use the wave method. So two days lead now, 
we'd go, we'd go very, very low intensity, but we'd be out on the floor for an hour. The day before the game, we'd actually compete a heck of a lot more than we did the day before the previous day. I used to flip it, Chris, because I didn't know, I didn't have all this knowledge, right. And all this data. Uh, and I think it's really, really, really helped our guys. Yeah, that's great stuff. I'm glad you shared that insight. I mean, if coaches want to look into peaking and tapering and all the physiology behind that, you're explaining it so well uh, and a lot of evidence behind that. So uh, so take us through that that Thursday practice then. You talked about not competing. So what type of things are we doing that day? Is that the day we're doing more of the walkthrough in terms of the scout? And then the next day we're going to do more of the competing in terms of focusing on us? Yes. So I, I would I would tell you, we would walk through, hey, these are so, this is kind of the meat and potatoes of what they do offensively, right? We know how to guard it. We may rep it versus scout team for, for 15, 20 minutes. Um, then we're going to say, okay, what else is really important in this game? Maybe a team that, uh, like Oklahoma State, when we were playing them, like they pressured like crazy. They deny everywhere. So we did ball security drills for, honestly, 25 minutes. You know, so what, what are the big themes? When our guys leave that practice – they should know what the keys to the game are. And if they don't, then we're not doing our job, right? They should know like, hey, listen, we have to take care of the ball. Ball security is really, really, really going to be important in this game. And that includes our press offense, you know, meeting the pass, being strong with the ball. Then, then it's also, hey, we know step-up screens are going to be really important in this game. We defended that really hard. I want them to leave the first practice of preparing for whoever our opponent is and know exactly what the heck we need to do. It's, 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 it's great stuff to be able to understand that. And then how are you incorporating video then in these two days prior to? So two days leading up to the game, we do personnel, yep. um, you know, and as a really as a team. Yes. And, and we keep that personnel film uh, to about seven minutes. I don't want it very long. We have our guys actually read it out loud, you know, instead of the coach reading it out loud. You know, I think that helps engage them a little bit more. Um, now, what we also do, you know, so then the next day, Chris, what we do is we do actions. And I, like I said earlier, we theme everything up. I don't want just random plays on there. Um, I don't think that sticks in our guys' minds. I want themes. Hey, you know, it could be, hey, we need, are we post trap in that game? Are we, you know, what? I don't know what it is, but there's a million different things you can come up with. Um, we do that the day before the game. Now, what we've done is, and I, and I think this has been really good, Chris, with scouting is, again, I always go back to you have to understand your audience, right? You know, I, we used to always have like this thick paper, you know, about 20 pages that we give. I've seen player. them, Coach. <laughs> yeah. You know, and listen, we've all done it. And like we give our players this, like, hey, here's, here's the scouting report. We take a lot of pride in it. A lot of hours have gone into it. And then guys don't read it. And so for us, it's how can I condense things? So now we give them a nice one page final scouting report, right? It's laminated. It looks nice. It's got great presentation. And then what we also do is I know our guys are connected at the hip to their phone, right? So what I do is I, I have each, uh, our assistant coach that has a scout will text out each player. their two main matchups for the game as well. So they're getting it via text. And they're getting extra film of those individuals via text. So because they're a heck of a lot more likely to watch it on their phone than they are if they're if it's just a sheet of paper. Right. So you've got to learn your audience. How can you how can they take in information? And how can you give them information that they can retain? I think that's so important. So just for the theme part, I just want coaches to understand this is chunking. This is classic chunking psychology strategy of grouping things together that helps people retain the information. The second thing I want to ask about, and you won't remember this, but I visited practice there. I think Chris Max, one of his last years, and you guys had this analytic leaderboard where you had different types of analytics and then you're ranking within your conference and different things like that. I don't know if that still exists, but that's another way that you guys used to make that information usable and understandable for players. Cause they all understand rankings. Yep. <laughs> Even if they don't understand the number, they understand the value of the number based on that. Is that still around? It absolutely is. Yeah. It's been here for a long time. We rely heavily on numbers, Chris, because again, our guys are all wired to compete, uh, to fight. And I think they understand like, Hey, listen, like this is what we need to do. It shows, it tells a story, 
right? I always say data, num- people lie, numbers don't lie, right? And when you look at it, it's like, man, it tells you the story exactly what you need to do. So what are some other ways that you make that information usable? You referenced the phone part of it, but for players, making analytics understandable and usable for them. Yeah, I, I don't want them to get too deep into it. You know, I try to really highlight, um, you know, specific specific things. Like, because each guy, each player, each matchup's different. You know, what does this guy do great? You know, like uh, what's his what's his offensive rebounding percentage when he's out on the floor? What's what are his percentage of shots from three? That tells the story of how you know. Again, a guy may not be shooting well from three, right? But his attempts, maybe eighty percent of his shots are from three. It's like, well, hey, they need to know that. Let's highlight that. Let's make sure that they know that. So, you know what? He is a shooter, even though his numbers aren't great right now. Maybe he hasn't been shooting as well as of late. Um, I think it's different for each guy. I really do. And again, it, but it does. It helps reinforce what we want them to remember, right? And, uh, and I think that's the important thing is each guy is a little bit different. How much shooting and skill work are players doing then on their own? Because we know that's a part of it that they like to get in the gym, get shots up on their own. Is that happening? Or are you making sure they're not in the gym so they're staying fresher with these, you know, only short two day turnarounds? Yeah, we do a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, You know, so like even uh, that first day of of practice after uh, the game, right? There's about 20 minutes of skill incorporated in there. We do skill every day. Yeah. Every day of practice. We shoot every day. We pass every day. We work on pivoting, um, ball handling. You know, players, again, development's year-round. And I think that's so important. And I think that can get lost easily during the year, right, because you're going game to game to game to game, and uh, you're preparing. You can't ever lose sight of that because if you can get your players better, think about it, that the off is usually roughly six to seven months, right, and then those other months of the year you're in season. If you're only developing – off season, that's half the time. And, and that's not good. Um, and that's not how you get your players better. So we work on it year round. Our guys are in the gym. Um, I think you know, our, our staff has an understanding. Listen, it's not about intensity. It's about reps. It's about keeping their confidence. It's about also part of development is showing film mm-hmm. of themselves. Right. You know, so they can watch that. Everybody on our team will watch film with their position coach before that next game. Is that one-on-one? That's one-on-one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's usually about a 10 to 15 minute session. And it's also just kind of, you're, you're always framing their mind and, and their mindset as well. You're showing film, but you're also touching that mind, which is so important. Um, you know, obviously you want them to get better with it, with the film, but you're also, like I said, just kind of shaping their mindset, which I think is really important moving forward. Well, which leads into how much good versus how much bad you're showing them or needs improvement are you showing them? And that's the art of this, isn't it? It is because, you know, if you just show all bad, you're going to lose them. Um, and then if you're just showing all good, I think, you know, again, I think you just got to be careful. I, I, you got to have an understanding of where guys are. Do guys need a little bit of love? Do guys need to be knocked down a little bit as well? You know, maybe they're feeling too good about themselves. Um, you know, we want our, our, the job of us coaches is to get guys to play at the optimum level of confidence, which is really, really hard, right? Especially with social media nowadays, right? I mean, it's like one, a young man has one bad game and it's the end of the world, right? And you got to be able to navigate the marathon and keep their confidence. Um, but we also need to get them better. So, you know, we, I always tell our staff, listen, I, I would love to go to two to one ratio, two good versus one bad. <laughs> would love to keep that if we can. Um, but there's some guys that are a little bit different, right? Chris, not everybody's built the same way. Not everybody's wired the same way. Some guys need that, that, that you got to be really transparent with your players. You can't give them fool's gold because oh, they'll yeah. sniff that out real quick. Well, and some players really crave that needs improvement type of feedback. And that's what Correct. they really want. Um, the other thing I referenced there is kind of like I used to have some players that are such hard workers that I actually had to ban them from the gym. Right. And you, you, you know what I'm talking about? It's like some and we always think hard work is such a positive. But as your strength coach reference, sometimes that's a deterrent or a negative as well. So can you talk about that aspect of the, those two balances between those two things? Yeah, you got to work smart. That's what I always tell our guys, you know, again, you know, working more is not always smart, you know, like that, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be efficient with what you do. Um, you gotta be efficient with 
staying in the gym. We're efficient. That's how we do practice, right? I plan it out with our strength coach. I, I look at it and say, listen, do you, is this good? And he gives me all the data throughout practice because we want to be efficient. And I think that's extremely important because it is a marathon. It's a long, long, long season. And you can't ever lose sight of that. So how different is the night? Like you, you play Wednesday night and then you're playing Saturday. How different is it when that Wednesday night is on the road? It's definitely different. I mean, because obviously you'd be traveling back. Um, you're not going to get back. Post game, do you travel back always? Yeah, we always travel. I would say yes. Typically, yes. we're always going to travel back that night of. And, you know, so it's a, you know, we'll get back sometimes at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And our guys may have class the next day, Chris, um, if we're in session. And, you know, so those guys will be at class at 9 a.m. in the morning. And so you just got to take into consideration, um, you know, as coaches, it's like, man, we got this game plan all of a sudden. We want to get ready. But you got to understand, again, where your guys' minds are and where their bodies are. Um, just the wear and tear. What, how was the game? What type of game was it? Was it a really physical game? Um, was it a tough loss? You know, like you got to take all those things into consideration how you plan that next day or else you're going to lose the game. That next game will, could be lost that day of practice. And I was going to really say rest lost. and recovery and mental attitude are more important than physical practice at that time of year, right? Absolutely. So will there be decisions to potentially cancel practice that day and give them extra recovery? Yes. We've if done so, that what before. is that based on? Yeah, we've done it this year where yeah. maybe our guys are a little bit banged up after talking to our trainer and our strength coach, or it could be, Hey, you know, I, I talk, I listen to our players. Listen, if, 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 if our guys say, Hey coach, man, like, we are exhausted. Gotcha. No problem. I'll deal. I'll talk to our trainer. I'll talk to our strength coach, talk to our staff, get their feedback, but we made us watch film and that's it. And, and I'm good with that. And then certain guys that maybe were the low minute guys, Chris, that didn't play as much in that previous game, they'll get a workout in. Right. But like the, the high minute guys, we may say, hey, listen, you guys are done. You guys are off today. It was, a, it was an absolute war last night. We got back really late. We're good today. Let's make sure we, we keep our guys fresh and make sure you get in the training room and, and all that good stuff. Right. And then you've already referenced you're reducing volume anyways. So they're not in the gym very long. And then the other part is you can manipulate intensity depending on that. But, uh, you know, there is also value sometimes to just getting in the gym together as a team. And you know, that cohesiveness and that kind of mentality refreshes players a lot too. So it's that kind of art to be able to figure out when the right time to do that. Now, in these examples, you played at home or you're playing at home both games, correct? Yes. Okay. So let's go into the alternatives, which is, you play at home Wednesday and now you have to travel on Saturday. So how are you traveling and what are some different things that change it when you have to travel for that game on Saturday? Yeah. If we have two road games in a row, uh, Chris, you know, uh, obviously hopefully we're not traveling back late, but probably are, you know, knowing in our league due to TV, um, you know, so you get back really late. Our guys will be in class all day that next day. We probably, the high minute guys probably wouldn't practice. But like you said, in a back-to-back -back road game is probably not going to happen. Um, you know, our, our, uh, we'd make sure they're in the training room. It's more of a recovery day. We do film, obviously we'd finish up, we'd close up the previous game. And then we'd also do film of, of personnel leading up to the next game. The low minute guys would get a, a workout in during our normal practice time. Our staff would work those guys out to keep them fresh. Cause again, listen, at some point we're going to need, need those. We need all of our guys on our team to be ready. And I think that's really important. Then that following day we would practice. Right. And and usually if we're going to be back out on the road, say we're on the road on Saturday again, we would travel on Friday. Right. So we we'd probably practice at 11 a.m. And our, we'd probably practice for about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes, you know, because, again, it's such a quick turnaround. Um, then we'd show we would travel to wherever we're going. We'd show film that night of their actions. So we've covered the personnel two days out actions the day before. And then usually we, I don't like shooting around twice in that gym, Chris. Um, you know, we used to, we'd get to that location and we'd shoot that night and then we'd shoot the next day as well. And to me, it's like, Hey, listen, let's save our legs. We won't shoot around that night. Um, especially unless the only way we'd shoot around that night, Chris, if it's like a noon tip that next day to where I don't like getting our guys up really early. I value the sleep more. And getting our guys up early to shoot. 
So the only way we'd shoot the night before the game on the road is if we can't get in to shoot around the day of. Um, if we can get in the day of, we won't do the night before. I don't like doing both. Again, like I said, just to save their legs. Yeah, and then game day shoot arounds have been one of those things that definitely changed my mind a lot, and especially that early shoot. And yet decide like, you know what, that's not worth it. It's it's not the be all and end all to get in the gym and get a shoot around, especially in your situations where you get on the court prior to the game with enough time to get shots up anyways, right? That's exactly right. And we practice with the basketballs. So say we're playing with a team that, that uses Under Armour basketballs. We practice with Under Armour basketballs for two days here at Xavier leading up to that game. So it's like, hey, we've already worked with the basketballs. Uh, like you said, we get we get there two hours before uh, on the uh, the game and our guys get a lot of shots. So the other part, I guess, that we're curious about is, like, how much correcting of your stuff are you doing in those two days? Because, again, you, you can only do so much. So if you recognize that there's a theme that's deficient or multiple themes that are deficient, you have to prioritize. So take us through some of that in terms of focusing on your stuff and correcting your stuff. Yeah, I would say that's probably the main focus, you know, for, for us. Um, you know, I, I, I always say, man, get really good at the things that happen a lot. Right. So, um, you know, transition defense happens a lot. Uh, ball screen defense happens a lot. Um, you know, blocking out happens a lot. You know, like you start to think about things that happen a lot. There's some things that don't. Right. You know, like um, off screen, certain, a lot of teams, the game's changed so much now. It's, it's a lot of dribble drive. It's a lot of ball screens. It's less off screens. When I say off screens, I'm saying pin downs, flare screens, stagger screens, there's less of those than there's ever been. And, you know, so we want to be really good at the things that happen a lot. And again, if I see that there's a little crack in our system that, that's starting to get bigger, then we're going to address it heavily during those two days leading up. Um, and because again, a lot of times, you know, you got to be good at transition defense, no matter who you're playing, right? You got to block out no matter who you're playing and you got to be really good in ball screen defense. Um, now again, there's, Different opponents do different things and, and, and have different philosophies and ways to play. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's again, it's always going to be more about us. So how different is it? You know, obviously you're having a great year, which is awesome. How different is it when you're struggling a little bit? in terms of how you approach things. I mean, we'd like to say we're trying not to do it any different, but we know there's a different mentality and a different type of nurturing we have to do in those moments where we're struggling. So can you take us through that a little bit about what difference you may have when you are struggling? Yeah, I, I think sometimes when I feel like we're doing really well, Chris, I am really hard on our guys. I don't want them to get complacent. Mm -hmm. When we're struggling a little bit, I may coddle on my hair more. Now, listen, if it ever if, if efforts ever an issue, that's when I get really, really mad. If right. it's about execution, then I'm not teaching them well enough. They're not understanding it well enough. That's on me. If that makes sense. Effort. That's on our players. And I and I and, and they know that um, I try when we're struggling with something, Chris, I'll try to simplify it even more. You know, like I think we all have these great ideas. Right. And on, on and, and it's like, man, but. It doesn't matter what you know. It just matters what you can get your players to execute, right, at the end of the day. And, you know, so for me, it's like, man, do, and can I simplify it more than, than we are, than we've already done? Maybe that's a problem. We're getting too complicated. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're always kind of reevaluating our system and making sure that, again, we're giving our guys the answers. They understand it. They know it. Um, and they can recognize it when it happens in live play. We don't like losing. You're just like us and everyone else. Nobody likes losing. But one of the advantages of uh, analytics, in my opinion, is that we can now quantify playing well and losing and that that helps us a lot to be able to frame it. And I'm curious if you're you have some insights for coaches to be able to help them do that, because uh, obviously, like the bottom line is win or lose, but you can play yeah. well and lose. Yeah. Listen, it's, it's it goes to our standards. You know, yeah. like our guys know. Uh, we have targets in games, you know, like it's what I do. I, it's, I have a sheet that I keep track of. And, and it's funny, like I'll have uh, Matthew Graves used to be on my staff. He used to be the head coach at South Alabama. He's not Indiana State, man. Gr great friend of mine gave me it a long time ago. And, and I've kept it to this day is when my, when my sheet's green, that means good. 
when it goes red, that certain area, that's bad. And I see different trends kind of as we go. So our guys will know, listen, hey, listen, our turnover percentage, we want it to be a certain percentage every game. So rather than saying, hey, listen, we want 11 or less turnovers or 12 or less, that's really not applicable in, in the game because, listen, there may be more possessions in certain games, right? They know we're looking at 17% of our possessions we want to take care of the ball. I let them know where we are every game in that area. Because like you said, you may play well and lose. But if, if, you, if you reach your standards more times than not, you're going to win. Right. You could play horrible and, and win, but you, and you don't feel good about it. Obviously, you win the game. But it, but at the end of the day, it's about playing well and playing to your standards. So our guys know our rebounding percentage numbers that we want on both ends of the floor. They know the turnover percentage. They know when we're hitting our marks, we're going to win a lot of games. Wondering if you can share some uh, academic insights, because, again, we understand you have an ideal situation, resources, a little bit better schedule in terms of being able to practice, as you said, at different times of the day, et cetera, et cetera. But for most small college high schools, they don't have much time and they don't have the ability to be able to manipulate some of those things. So thinking of those coaches, what are some of the insights that you've gathered to be able to help your players academically stay on track with this type of schedule? Yeah, it's, it's, it can be, uh, it can be hard. Chris, when we're traveling all over the country, I mean, it's, it's difficult being a student athlete, um, but I think number one, making sure that they understand what the expectations are at the very beginning, right? When we recruit young men into our program, we make sure that their family members and uh, their circle, they know how important academics are here at Xavier. That's first of all, we've graduated 111 straight seniors in a row. It dates all the way back to 1986. Wow. We take a ton of pride in that. And they know the non-negotiables. Listen, I, I have zero tolerance for guys that don't go to class. Zero tolerance for guys that don't turn in work on time. Zero tolerance for guys that lie. I want guys, listen, if, if a guy struggles with a certain material, no problem. We'll, we got all the resources in the world. We have tutors. We have our own academic advisor that travels with us. Again, that does study tables on the road. Um, that is, everything's in place for people to be successful here at Xavier. They just have to do their part. And I think, you know, we meet – uh, I meet every week with our academic advisor every Monday morning, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? I, I always want the ugly first. Give me the, give me the worst first. And if there are any bad reports, and then I deal with those each individual um, very transparently. I have, I have meetings every week with our players right now. Part of that is defining roles and I want them to know why they're getting the amount of minutes that they're getting. Because, again, I want to try to keep everybody happy and on, and on the ship and head in the same direction. But part of that meeting as well is talking about academics. Are there any issues? I know before going, going into those meetings what the issues are, if there are any. And then we're going to handle those uh, accordingly. You know? But I want them to know that I know because I, want them, because I have to care. If they don't think that I care, then they won't care ultimately. One of the most important things I, I mean, I – think was a strength for me to deal with academics was to have informal conversations. And I'm sure you're doing that with your players that you're asking them, how did a test go? Or, you know, Hey, this subject sounds really interesting. Tell me something you learned, you know, those type of things that show that you're interested beyond just the grade. Right. Absolutely. Like our, our whole staff will know, listen, if Dewan Odom's got a test uh, tomorrow or a paper, it's coming up in two days, how are we doing on that? And it's, it's amazing when they know that, you know, and that you're taking an interest in details of what's going on, they do that much better. You brought up an interesting concept there too, which is this danger of overloading their phones nowadays with too much, you know, like you and all your staff and everyone can text them and say, hey, how's this going or whatever. And that's a danger, isn't it as well? It is, you know, you can do too much and then they're going to start tuning you out, <laughs> right? And uh, so you got to have, so we have each guy in our staff has, has three players, that they have to monitor basically academically. They're mm -hmm. responsible for those along with our academic advisor and they keep me all in the loop as well. So they're, they're the ones hitting them specifically about like assignments and, and papers and tests that are coming up maybe. And then they'll give me the good news too, Chris. Like it's not always bad news bears around here academically. I want to be the guy that goes to, uh, goes to Kiki Tandy and says, hey, listen, I heard you got a 95 on that test. That's big time. No, you worked really, really hard on it. And just reinforcing that positive feel to give our guys confidence moving forward academically.
Well, I love how you connected that back to effort, right? This growth mindset mentality, which I think so many coaches are starting to understand is that, you know, it's not a hey, great job on this test, great job studying for this test and putting effort into it that led to this mark and then reinforcing that growth mindset. Absolutely. It, it all comes back down to effort. That, that's what I want from all of our guys. Max effort, everything we do in life, right? Whether it's academics, doesn't matter what you're doing. Another question about the phone then, and I'm curious about this, is do you set expectations for your players in terms of what type of response is okay? Are they allowed to just give you a thumbs up response or do they have to communicate back in words or is are, am I thinking too far beyond what it's yeah, what I Chris, should be? That's a good question. Um, I, I think uh, the biggest thing is getting a response. Yeah. Right. You know, when it, when it goes crickets, so they I have to respond. They you have to <laughs> respond. I, I think that's so important. Um, just let, let us know, Hey, that you got the message uh, that you saw it. Cause again, these guys are all attached to their phones as we all know. And, and we all are, it seems like nowadays and, and, you know, just respond. That's just being respectful. Um, it's, it's a, it's a form of communication. Um, back to film sessions, uh, you talked about engaging your players in terms of scout that they read it out loud. Uh, in terms of film sessions, are you doing different things to engage them with the film session in terms of questions and seeking responses to engage them deeper? What other things are you doing? Yeah, I think, I think anytime you can get them to talk, I think that's a great thing. If you're talking at them, then you've lost them. Uh, you got to talk with them. It's got to be a two-way communication. Um, and I think that helps them retain more information and it helps them, you know, pay attention a lot more. Keeps them on their toes too, Chris, because you may say like, hey, listen, I, I love asking just random questions to see if guys are paying attention. And, and if they're not, then that's a problem. You know, we put them on the spot a little bit. But we also want to make it fun because, listen, you want to make it interactive. It gets boring if you're just talked at. And, and then we also want to do funny things. Like every once in a while, listen, it, it, if we played opponent twice or maybe the game before, um, somebody got dunked on or from our team or, or maybe they, they fell down or something goofy kind of happening. And we may throw that clip in randomly in the middle of the, uh, of the personnel edit, right. Just so those guys can have fun with it a little bit, because it is, again, listen, it can become tedious, the process it's, it's film, 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 film. And, and again, you got to keep it fresh with your guys. Uh, and, and this is a perfect example because we're, we're referencing non-conference and conference. And I'm curious, are there any differences for non-conference to conference in terms of how you prepare or anything that's different? There's not really any difference. I mean, yeah. we treat every game the same. Um, but again, especially on the second time that we played that opponent, I tell our staff, keep it even tighter. They already know the opponent. Again, like we got to understand, listen, this is, we're, we're playing 20 league games. That's a lot. And again, we got to keep their attention as best as possible. So usually we just have those guys talk. So now we got through all this and now we're finally at game day again. Take us through your personal preparation on game day. What type of things are you doing to prepare yourself for the game? Um, you know, it's funny. So I have a routine, uh, as we all do. We, we get in, in very strict routines. I always have breakfast with my wife the first thing in the morning um, after we get our kids to school if it's a weekday. Um, I always go, you know, I get, I get to the office right after that. So even if it's an 8 30 PM tip, I'm in the office basically all day. I like, we always have shoot around five hours before. And I know that, but I've already planned out all of our offensive game plan, defensive game plan, everything's in substitution patterns. I usually do all that stuff the day before just to make sure we got it tight. So what I like to do before the hour leading up before a shoot around, I go over like with Danny Peters who's in charge of substitutions. I also meet with the scout coach who's responsible for matchups. I go back over with those guys. Listen, these, these are the sub patterns that I want the shell, you know, for, for that first half. And then I'll also hear the matchups that I want to stay away from Here are the matchups that I want to see. Then I go back over again with each guy. Like I know Dante Jackson's got underneath that of bounds here are the UOBs that I really like in certain situations. Here, Danny Peters, I go back over here, the UOB defense, let's make sure we have everything nice and tight. Just making sure we're tightening up that game plan leading up to shoot around, right? Um, I usually watch, I, I like to watch the edits one last time in the morning before we have that meeting, the personnel edit, the offensive edit, and the defensive edit, just to make sure I'm on top of it. Um, 
you know, I always, like I said, I'll tighten up. I usually have my offensive game plan on a, uh, on a sheet of paper and then it's got, uh, it's laminated. You know, so I'll go over that again in my mind, just making sure there are any ATOs that I like, you know, time, you know, plays out of timeouts or certain guys we need to attack, um, different things like that. Um, and then, you know, what's, what's kind of probably unique, Chris, I like to always go, uh, I go home between shoot around and the game. Um, I like to see my kids one last time uh, before the game, uh, for you. My two little boys. So I always try to play basketball with them uh, before I head back in. I'm always back in here though, at least two hours before the game. Yeah. Good for you doing that. Uh, and then what's, what type of things are on your game day sheet? Yeah. So you're talking about my offensive game sheet. Um, so different scenarios, you know, what are we running or if we're down by two or up by, you know, all the scenarios at the end of games, what are we running? I uh, already got that set in stone. Um, same thing, like, listen, I, going into the game, I really think when number 50 for the other teams in at the five, we need to get him away from the rim, right? How are we doing that? You know, when we have certain guys in the game, we may, we may be popping guys a little bit more. How do we get him out on the perimeter? Whereas when they have number 24 at the five, I want to go inside, right? When they, you know, so I have like little, all these little notes on there and plays that we're going to do, how we're going to try to take advantage of certain personnel that they have out on the, on the floor at, at specific times. That's awesome insights. Uh, coach, how, wh what is your player's routine then? Or what is your preference for your players in terms of that from say game day shoot to game time? Yeah. So, you know, we shoot around always five hours before we have meal right after that. Okay. Um, and then what our guys will do, they have to be in the arena two hours before okay. have to, so they can go back to their rooms if they want, but they have to be in the arena two hours before, um, you know, I, those guys all shoot with their position coach before our warm up actually starts. So our warm up starts 70 minutes before the tip. Um, you know, so with, with our strength coach, Chase Campbell. So our, but all those guys will be in position groups, getting extra shots up leading up to that moment. Right. I'd say usually between two hours before and 70 minutes before the game, they're getting a little, a mini workout, just a bunch of shots. And then 70 minute mark. That's when our strength coach, you know, starts our active warm up. And then we go through a couple, you know, a team warm up, and then we always bring them back in 52 minute mark. Um, we go back over personnel very briefly, and then we go one last time. And then I always go over our offensive and defensive game plan very briefly. And then those guys stretch, they go back out and warm up a little bit again. And then they come back in one last time to say a prayer. And then uh, I give them one little last uh, little speech, and then we go out there and play. Fun. Fine. How do you account for individual preferences in your players? Because all obviously all players have their own unique game day preparation type of routine. So how do you account for that? Yeah, we, we try to allow them to have that flexibility throughout the day and even pre team workout mm -hmm. or pre team warm up. Once we go to team warm up, it's all about the team. Yep. I want everybody looking the same. I don't want headphones on. I'm one guy. One guy has headphones on. I just think that's a bad look. It gives the wrong vibe. Um, and listen, I. If you want to wear headphones previous to that, no problem. But listen, once we get to the team warm up, it's all about the team. You got to be able to engage, right? You're not in a silo. It's not a game of one on one. Uh, it's a game of five on five. So I want to make sure that those guys are interacting. Coach, I mean, I just, first of all, I got to thank you for continuing the great tradition at Xavier of sharing the game. I mean, from the newsletter to obviously a lot of your GAs and different types of managers sharing so much information. I mean, you've got to be one of the most transparent programs. And I know as coaches, we all appreciate that. So thanks for continuing that. Uh, you know what? That's what this is all about, Chris. And it's what you do. And again, again you have uh, an incredible product here. It's awesome. Uh, what you do is sharing the game. And I've been a big fan of yours over the years, man. Like you do a great job. I've gotten a lot of great ideas from you. That's what basketball is all about. It's helping each other uh, continue to have that growth mindset and learn, right? Absolutely. been a lot of fun. And uh, I guess the last question is, when do you actually sleep? <laughs> <laughs> During the season, not very often. I, yeah. I wish I slept a little bit more. I need more sleep than I get. I know that. My wife always says that. But, you know, you try to maximize your days. Again, man, it's, it's, I have my days are, are jam-packed with meetings and, and film and recruiting, right? I didn't even mention recruiting yet, me. I got to go fly all over the place and recruit. Um, you just, again, I sleep in the off season. That's what I always say. <laughs> 
Uh, it's great stuff. I cannot thank you for sharing these insights and sharing these insights in season. And uh, we wish you all the best to be able to continue a great season. Thanks, Chris.